climate imperative is going to be presenting up next on the clean air agenda, zero emission appliances. So Bruce is the executive director of climate imperative is an energy innovation project to cut carbon emissions at the speed and scale needed to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. For the two years prior to joining Climate Imperative, Bruce was managing director at Rocky Mountain Institute, where he designed and launched the Building Electrification Campaign, which aims to eliminate fossil fuels from 70 million buildings. So a real brilliant activist and thinker on this topic, a true leader. Thank you, Bruce, for sharing your insights with us today. Well, uh, thank you, John. I'm thrilled to join you. Um, I'm going to say a couple of words just to sort of put it in context before I share some slides. Uh, so I come at this work after spending uh, almost two decades working on reducing the burning of coal fire, coal in the United States, where I used to lead up Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. Uh, it's one of the great opportunities in my career working with communities who are being hammered by coal pollution, all forms of it, coal mining, coal burning, coal ash disposal. And in the process, learn a lot about air pollution and the profound impact air pollution has on people. Uh, and that today in the United States, we still have over 100 million Americans living in cities where it is unsafe to breathe. Uh, and when I started that work, there was no question that coal was a big part of that puzzle. And so in learning all about this air pollution, um, it was this profound aha moment that literally happened just a couple of years ago where I realized that the gas appliances in my home were the biggest piece of my carbon footprint and the biggest piece of the air pollution puzzle in my community. Um, because after doing all this work on coal and thinking about the national debate we had about the urgency of phasing out coal, uh, no one had ever talked about air pollution being um, greatly exacerbated in many parts of our country by the burning of gas in our buildings. And so that really set me off on a, on a learning lesson to really understand how big a deal is it? And just sort of some of these strange things that were going on in my life where I was spending my day fighting air pollution and coming home and turning on my gas stove and engaging in that most secret of, sacred of practices, cooking dinner for your family and not putting two and two together that the burning of a fossil fuel in an enclosed space is a really bad idea. Mm. We are warned not to park our car in our garages and idle it because you will <laughs> die of carbon monoxide. Mm -hmm. For those of you who love camping, if you read the label, the warning label on your canister when you go cooking, camping, it says, warning in big letters, do not use an enclosed space. But yet in my home, and I consider myself fairly well versed on air pollution, no one had ever told me that this damn gas stove was actually a major threat to my family. So let me put this in context with a couple of slides, but just um, it's really been an aha moment. And thanks to you and a bunch of others, um, shoulders of giants I have stood on learning about electrification, um, but really interested in this air pollution piece because it's, uh, it's the next big opportunity to really clean up our homes and our cities across this country and, and, and around the world. So a couple of slides to put this in context. Um, So, you see my slides? Yes, you want to put Great. it in presenter mode. Great, thank you. And so, I um, want to start with just sort of the basics, which ground us in how the work ahead on, on addressing air pollution from appliances. Uh, so, natural gas. This right now, we're seeing um, if you could pause, go back. Uh, you're not in the presenter mode, but instead, you have like the, the, the yes. next slide and previous slides. See that. Yes. Go down on the bottom, I think, there where there's a little that, yeah, next to that one. Oh, not that one, next one over, and one after that to the right. That's the one. Does that work? Well, it's the same. Why don't you just continue? Don't worry about it. For some reason, how's that? That is not, oh, there, that's it. All right. You're gold. Um, so, most of your attendees will know this, but just to ground us. Um, so the climate crisis requires us to not only stop burning coal and oil, but obviously gas. And gas is a particular threat because it's now the fastest growing piece of our climate puzzle. Here's just a couple of recent quotes from climate experts. Um, if we continue to expand gas, there is no way we avoid one and a half degrees of warming. Uh, and the fascinating piece globally is the recent 
announcement by the International Energy Agency that we need to, over the next couple of years, phase out the sale of all fossil fuel boilers, including water heaters and furnaces in our buildings. So this is the urgency as dictated by the science. So how do we put in place the policies to get us there? Uh, and again, from a US perspective, boiling down to our country, um, a lot of people talk about coal as being a big piece of our carbon footprint. We've made enormous progress on coal. We're almost done uh, with half of coal and we'll be done with coal in the next 10 or so years. We'll be done with coal by 2030. But look at this yellow line. That's the carbon emissions from natural gas climbing steadily. Uh, that is obviously in the wrong direction if we're trying to solve the climate crisis. So most people are not aware that today in the United States, natural gas emits twice as much carbon, put aside methane for a second, uh, as all the coal burning left in the United States. So gas has to go if we're gonna solve the climate crisis. Currently, we're going in the wrong direction in many places. We're digging the hole deeper. Uh, the American Gas Association loves to promote that a new gas customer is being added to the gas distribution system every minute more than 400,000 um, in recent years, 10,000 miles of new gas pipeline. And all of this is with the pretext that we're gonna pay for it over the next 30 to 80 years, well beyond any reasonable climate targets. Uh, here's some good news and bad news. The good news is these are the states that are growing the fastest, adding the most new gas customers as of uh, 2017 and hold through today. And why the work on gas bans is so important here in California and now spreading around the country. California has been going in the wrong direction faster than any other state in the union, adding more gas customers than any other place, including Texas, uh, because of all the policies promoting gas that have been in place for the last two or three decades. Uh, but it gives you some sense of the places where we can really make a difference, starting with California, but a bunch of other places where the opportunity is to get this going in the other direction as fast as possible. Uh, and this, this just underscores the, the challenge we're in. This is building emissions in the United States from commercial and residential buildings. Yellow is the carbon from gas, the little uh, other lines are oil or propane. There's a methane leakage, depending on your assumptions, um, all to say that building emissions are not coming down anywhere close, They're not coming down period, let alone aligned with our climate goals. But here's the, the issue that uh, adds a whole new sense of urgency. If the, in case the climate crisis wasn't enough. The burning of fossil fuels has profound impacts on public health. The outdoor air pollution, as we all know, that all the gas appliances at our home, with the exception of the gas stove, are required to be vented outdoors for good reason, because if you vented your water heater indoors, you would die from carbon monoxide poisoning. But the outdoor impacts of all of these millions and millions of appliances is that is now contributing twice as much outdoor air pollution as all the gas plants in the United States. And indoor, these gas stoves in our increasingly tight, our increasingly insulated homes uh, are a major threat, uh, particularly to children uh, and asthmatics. Here's the numbers uh, pulled from the EPA National Emission Inventory. This is the amount of nitrogen uh, oxides and nitrogen coming from gas power plants in the United States, and then you see gas appliances. And the fascinating thing about this is that gas plants actually burn more gas than gas appliances in our buildings. And the reason gas power plants emit less nitrogen dioxide is because we've been regulating them and putting in place measures to protect people from gas power plants for almost 50 years. We've had very, very little effort to, by regulators to date to do something about the health impacts posed by gas appliances. And so today, in many of the places where we have serious air pollution, including across most of California, the Northeast, the Upper Midwest, uh, gas appliances are a major reason why it's often unsafe to breathe because of soot uh, and smog pollution. So let me talk about gas stoves, because this is the one that really, that I was just completely, um, blown away by in a bad way, because it never occurred to me though, it's so obvious as you think through the basics. The burning of a fossil fuel inside an enclosed space, particularly as we weatherize and increase insulation and air sealing and all the things that we've been doing for the last 30 years to make our homes tighter, burning a fossil fuel in an enclosed space has profound public health impacts. And the study that really helped illuminate this to me was terrific work by the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab 
where they did a bunch of statistical analysis and monitoring homes in Southern California. And they concluded that there are about 12 million homes here in California that every winter as we close our windows, turn on our gas stoves, that 12 million Californians have lived in homes where it regularly is unsafe to breathe according to EPA health-based standards for nitrogen dioxide. So let me dig into this a little more. So nitrogen dioxide is a byproduct of burning fossil fuels. It doesn't come from food. And one of the things the gas industry loves to do is try to confuse us by saying, well, you get air pollution from doing anything. Well, that's not true. When you boil water, or bake a potato, bake some bread, no one has ever told us that if you're using gas, that you're posing a serious risk to yourself and to your children. So NO2 is a powerful lung irritant. We've regulated it federally since the 1970 Clean Air Act was enacted. Um, it is one of the most studied air pollution pollutants in the United States. It's one of six that EPA has um, analyzed under federal law every five years, understanding the science as to why it is bad and what we should do about it. Um, it has been litigated every time EPA strengthens the standard, the industry appeals. Um, and most recently in 20. 16, EPA updated the nitrogen dioxide standard and added a one hour standard. Historically, they'd only looked at NO2 standards over the long term, over 365 days or annually, what were the exposure rates? But they concluded in 2016 that they needed to set a one hour standard because short acute spikes of NO2, they said, cause asthma attacks and may indeed actually cause asthma in otherwise healthy children. So, for almost a decade now, we've known that these short spikes of NO2 that correlate very uh, well with what happens with a gas stove uh, are a serious public health threat. But so far, EPA has washed its hands by saying we don't regulate indoor air quality. And every other regulator, with the exception of the California Energy Commission to date, has basically washed their hands of something that, um, if you actually take the time to go through the 40 years of study, is something that researchers have known about now for decades. And this last one, I'll just underscore. A kid in a home with a gas stove is a 42% increased risk of asthma symptoms. When I was working on coal-fired power plants, it was common knowledge that we have an asthma epidemic in the United States. It impacts somewhere between one and uh, 12 kids in the United States. Uh, and the economic cost, in addition to the human suffering, is enormous. We spend about $80 billion in the United States every year treating asthma cases. That includes hospitalizations, nebulizers, inhalers. Uh, here in California, we spend about $12 billion a year on asthma. And about half of that is paid for by the taxpayers because we provide healthcare for low-income families. So it's a huge hit, the cost of asthma, the economic cost in addition to profound health issues. Um, we spend 90% of our time in our homes we have never put two and two together. The regulators have never put two and two together to ask the question, when a kid ends up in the emergency room with an asthma attack, are we sending them right back into a home that the researchers have told us now for almost 40 years is putting that kid at enormous risk of ending back in the hospital. Here's just one of the many studies, um, straight line correlation. The more gas you use, the greater the risk of asthma. Um, this is one of many studies out there um, showing that there's profound difference in NO2 levels, basically very, very little background what's outdoors. If you have an electric stove and when you add in a gas stove, particularly a gas stove with a pilot, you see these numbers rising pretty quickly. Um, my former colleagues at Sierra Club and um, also Rocky Mountain Institute and a couple of other uh, terrific organizations, Mothers Out Front and Social, Physicians for Social Responsibility put together this great report summarizing all of this health science back last year two years ago now, uh, for the very first time, taking these 40 years of research studies and putting it into accessible plain English so that we could begin to elevate this insanity of burning a fossil fuel in our homes without understanding or doing something about the profound health impacts associated with um, nitrogen dioxide in particular. So for those of you who are looking for more information, this is a great resource with all the studies listed um, in the appendix. So let me talk a little about the gas industry because one of the things we've been trying to work out is how long has the gas industry known about this? Is this like the oil and gas industry on climate change? Is this like the coal industry, 
hiding information for decades. So in 1986, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, who is one of the regulators who's supposed to be protecting us from this pollution, they regulate stoves. Um, and to their credit, they've made sure that stoves don't tip over because apparently gas stoves and electric stoves used to tip over and crush children. And to their credit, they decided that was a bad idea. But every time they've got close to doing something about air pollution, they've balked and neglected their responsibility. In 1986, they asked the EPA Science Advisory Committee, should we be concerned about the nitrogen dioxide? This was their explicit question. Should we be concerned about nitrogen dioxide from gas stoves in 1986? the height of when indoor air quality was a big issue um, around the United States. EPA wrote back from their science advisory committee saying, absolutely, NO2 is a profoundly dangerous chemical. It is not something you wanna be breathing in large amounts. So what you Consumer Product Safety Commission should do is to measure what are the NO2 levels that are happening from gas stoves in people's homes. And if it's above the levels we've determined are safe, we as the expert agency on the health impacts, you should do something about it in 1986. Nothing has happened since 1986. And if you go back and look at what each of the regulators have done over the years, they walk up to the edge of saying, well, it's not a good idea to have sources of combustion in your house, but there's literally not a single agency that's actually connecting the science and informing people about the dangers associated with it. The gas industry is going even further and is deliberately um, trying to promote this product without any warning. Uh, there's a great piece in Mother Jones, which is what this slide is from. And you can see one of their many Instagram uh, advertising pieces is this great gas stove with no ventilation. And if you look across what your local gas utility is doing, in many instances, in all instances, there's no warnings, and in many instances, there's not even a recommendation to use ventilation. So indoor and outdoor air pollution, a profound impact from gas appliances. Um, so what can we do about it? And who should be doing something about it? So it turns out that the regulators have broad authority. This is not a matter of Congress needs to do something. This is that the agencies responsible for protecting us need to do what they've been empowered to do for many, many years. So EPA has a long history of regulating various sources of air pollution, everything from coal fire power plants to wood stoves. And the way they do it is typically they assess how big a con contributor to the air pollution problem across the United States are various kinds of uh, products or devices, boilers, and then set standards based on the best available science, best available technology. So EPA has set standards, for example, for wood stoves to cut down dramatically on the amount of pollution um, being emitted by wood stoves, which are also a big source of urban air pollution in many cities. EPA set standards for um, cement plants and steel plants and power plants. Uh, and they have broad authority to also be setting what are called new source performance standards for furnaces, water heaters, and other gas appliances like dryers. We approached uh, EPA and others to urge them to start thinking about getting serious about doing something about building, given the huge impact on public health and climate. Uh, one of the great uh, partner organizations out there, um, the New York um, uh, School of Law Institute for Public uh, Integrity wrote a long piece laying out EPA's broad legal authority to do this, to set standards for furnaces, water heaters, and gas appliances, other gas appliances. Uh, and there's wide agreement that there's, there's only thing holding back EPA is the political will to do something. So particularly exciting on this front is that um, thanks to the work of many advocates, um, this work is actually already underway at the local level here in California. So the Bay Area Air Quality Management District that is responsible for protecting air quality here in the Bay Area is in the middle of a rulemaking to set what will be the first air quality standards for um, gas water heaters and gas furnaces and are planning to issue those draft rules as soon as um, this year. It will be the first in the nation. 
just like Little Old Berkeley was the first to ban gas in new buildings and spark a national and global debate about the urgency of phasing out gas in new buildings, the Bay Air, Air Quality Management District is poised to be the first to really have regulators taking seriously the profound public health and climate impacts associated with appliances and begin to set increasing standards on manufacturers to supply us with more and more zero emission appliances, i.e. all electric appliances. That is also under consideration now at the Air Resources Board, our state agency that's responsible for air pollution issues uh, statewide here in California. It's an urgent need and there's uh, significant interest because the state, as those of us who live here know, there's 30 million of us who live in counties where it's regularly unsafe to breathe, particularly folks living in the LA um, and in the Inland Empire and Central Valley parts of California, where gas appliances are contributing today more pollution than all the light duty vehicles, cars and SUVs on our highways. So they are eager to um, start setting standards for appliances as well. And also over in New York, on the other side of the country, the state of New York, as a part of its climate plan, is also beginning to set uh, standards for gas appliances as well. So this is the sort of vanguard opportunity for regulators who have deep experience on addressing public health issues, getting serious about a part of the puzzle they have basically missed for the last few decades, other than some very modest um, reductions that were required in California about 10 years ago. Then on into air quality, uh, this is where the Consumer Product Safety Commission needs to step in and assume all of the authority that they've been given to protect consumers from the threat of um, the air pollution from gas stoves. And I see I, I um, somehow missed a piece of my last sentence here. So Consum Consumer Product Safety Commission has broad authority over gas appliances. Uh, they can and should be providing warning labels or requiring the manufacturing manufacturers to install warning labels. Um, and also, as advocates have been uh, pushing here in California, requiring automatic ventilation. It's not good enough just to warn people because obviously there are many users of gas stove who may not read. I'm thinking of my children um, or people who don't speak English as a first language. Uh, the only way to make sure gas stoves would be safer would be to require automatic ventilation. Uh, and that falls broadly within the authority of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And last but not least, of course, um, we need to make sure that this transition is equitable, both on the appliance standards and also on the, getting the gas stoves out of about 40 million buildings in the United States. Uh, and that will require additional resources from the state and federal government. A couple more slides here. Um, uh, this is just a slide um, that my friends at Rocky Mountain Institute pulled together just to sort of give a further visualization visualization of what the appliance standards look like. Uh, so what the state of California did about 10 years ago is they did a very minor turn on setting lower NOx standards for water heaters and furnaces. So basically cracked open the door, asserted their authority, got sued by the manufacturers, they won, and today in California, the water heaters and furnaces we sell are slightly lower NOx emissions than in the rest of the country. What we're urging is that the regulators take that authority to the next level, and instead of setting, quote, lower NOx standards, they set zero emission standards because, as Sean and others share so well, zero emission appliances, all electric appliances are here, um, and we can um, replace all these gas appliances with electric. Um, over the next few years, and we don't need to be taking a stepping stone in between. So that, um, oh, I would be remiss not to say, share a fantastic study out of the researcher at Stanford hot off the presses today. Um, so we know that gas is a big problem because of the indoor air pollution. It's also a profound methane issue. And this study that was picked up today in the New York Times, Washington Post, and a bunch of other outlets um, really got at this question of, we know the gas leaks when you drill for it at the wellhead and, the, and in the oil fields, how much is coming out in our homes? Because the gas industry says, well, we didn't fix all the gas leaks. Well, no one's coming into my house and checking all the um, joints to make sure gas isn't leaking. And it turns out 
gas is leaking everywhere. So this study looked at a bunch of homes here in California and concluded uh, that the gas stove is leaking even when it's turned off. Even when your gas stove is turned off, it's leaking at all the joints, the, the pipes connecting to the wall, the pipes, every joint is a place where they are finding leaks. And uh, so gas stoves are not only a big health issue, they're also a profound part of the climate puzzle. They estimated that all the gas stoves in the country are equivalent to about 500,000 500, automobiles. So gas stoves are a piece of the health and climate puzzle. And the good news is the, so the great presenter had uh, right before me, we don't need gas stoves because we have a better alternative today. Let's do this. Fantastic, Bruce. Hey, um, a question for you from Tom Cabot, one of our wonderful electrification peers. Um, Bruce, can we ask the EPA to require a zero NOx standard for appliances in non-attainment states or non-attainment counties? This would yeah. encourage air district action like ones under consideration by the BAAQMD later this summer. What do you think? Um, so the advocates are um, already talking to EPA about how do they do this? Because EPA has broad authority to set zero, uh, zero standards. That's what the good folks at NYU Law School laid out in a 20 page legal memo. Mm. Um, and so really this is the only thing holding us back is our ability to push and support EPA to do it. And having the Bay Area Air Quality Management District going first, having the states demonstrate how to do this will only further empower EPA. Okay. So this is the, one of those examples like our municipal leadership has made a big difference in the state and the national conversation. Like all these opportunities where we have little organizations that can make strong policies, show how it gets done and then expand elsewhere and, and have a whole bunch of them ideally. So the very best of the best float to the top. That's right. And, and that's how we've done policy over many issues, right? You have states and local jurisdictions set policy work out that it's a good issue. People are excited about it, that it provides real benefits, that it works economically, that we can do so equitably. And then EPA steps in and sets the national standard that picks up all the laggard states. So it's no secret that Texas anytime soon is not going to be putting in place a gas ban. So let's get it done in many other places. And then EPA sets a national standard and Lo and behold, Texas will come along too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, let's see here. Um, oh, this is a technical question for you. Uh, Dave Inter wanted to know if a charcoal filter removes NOx and other pollutants in recirculated ventilating systems. No, no. So that's one of the real uh, uh, challenges is that people um, don't realize that many apartments, there's a lot of apartments that don't have any ventilation. And there are a bunch of apartments that have these recirculating, which are only good for particulate matter. Um, and so they don't take out gases. So the charcoal won't take out your gas. So we got to make sure all ventilation is connected to the outdoors if we're actually going to do something about the air pollution in our, in our units. But obviously, the easier option is just to get rid of the gas stuff. Gotcha. So, um, I realize that like you are at the tip of the spear. I understand you have a, you have a lot of in conversations that are on the inside because you're an inside player. I consider myself an outside player and you're inside and you know, <laughs> and we're pincers. Um, so what can you tell us that is gossipy that isn't tipping your hand too much? Um, well, so the, you know, the end of 2021, New York City banned gas, right? It was this amazing, amazing grassroots effort that literally started six months earlier, inspired by California. And these activists had done a lot of work historically on gas. They banned fracking in New York State, which had been a big, super amazing victory four or five years ago. And uh, when they realized that there was something they could do about gas in buildings, they were so fired up. And they just went to town. And uh, despite COVID, organized Zoom city council meetings, um, and that kind of momentum was just, it was contagious. So mm -hmm. there's now moves afoot and the governor is committed to ban gas statewide in New York state. New York and California together are about 18% of all the gas burned in the United States, right? So this is an area where this is primarily a blue and purple state issue because it's the big population states. This is not an issue in Idaho or Alabama. It's actually not an issue largely in the Southeast because they don't use a lot of gas. 
-hmm. as you know, Sean, they never they never went to gas because they went to resistance electric and they said, eh, this efficiency stuff and this other stuff, we're just gonna keep being inefficient, but it was all electric. So in Orlando, Florida, you can't get gas at your house, for example. Uh, and infrastructure and, issues with the Appalachian Mountains and infrastructure issues with the, the swamps of Florida. That's right. And cheap hydro and cheap coal, all of it, yeah. And that's not right. much more, yeah, not much winter heating. Um, heat pumps. They did use heat pumps for space heating, just right. not so much for water heating. Yeah, that's right. I was very surprised to learn that we we actually sell as many heat pumps in the United States as we do gas furnaces, but it's not in California, New York. It's in the southeast, right? So this is an example. I, I remember talking to a developer in, in Atlanta, Georgia. Ninety nine percent of multifamily units in Atlanta are all electric. Ninety nine percent of multifamily units are all electric and 55% of single family homes. Um, they're well ahead of us, right? This is where we can be learning from Birmingham, Alabama about how to do this. Yeah. You know, I looked at it, there, there's, there's 12 black owned HVAC businesses in Atlanta, Georgia. And I, and I was thinking about, I like, got for our efforts today to talk about equity, about affirmative recruiting. And it's like, we should be going to Atlanta, Georgia and talking, I mean, there's a dozen really experienced folks or like second generation that kind of thing like they know how to do hvac and we should be making alliances because the south has been leading i let's agree examples of that but, but let's bless them let's let's let's, let's give them credit and then like ride that to the in some sort of bipartisan way so that we can win faster that's yeah. right um so, um, but I think the other thing I would add is I mean, the, the issue about the gas stove is now front page. It was on the NPR this morning. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, division in this country. Most everyone agrees that air pollution in kids is a bad thing and that there's usually bipartisan support for doing something about gas stoves or uh, air pollution. Um, as you know, Sean, that the gas stove has sort of been the selling point for the gas industry when I was actually in Birmingham, Alabama, meeting with Alabama Power, who we have fought for years on, on coal-fired power plants, they don't sell gas. And I asked them, you know, what's the deal with your gas utility? And they're like, oh, we hate them. We're fighting with them all the time. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. He's, I was like, fighting in what way? And he says, the gas industry goes door to door in Birmingham, Alabama, selling people on gas stoves. So they literally knock on doors and say, how would you like a gas stove? And that's the sizzle, right? That's the thing they're selling. And as soon as people get hooked, they're like, oh, can we get you a gas water heater? Because that's the volume they need to justify adding gas service to a home. Um, and if they don't have a gas stove, they have nothing that anyone cares about because no one cares about how their clothes are dried or the house is heated or the uh, water is heated. Um, and they are on very, very thin ice with this gas stove where at some point the public just turns against them and says, wait a minute, why would we ever expose anyone we cared about to the dangers of a gas stove? And we see the kind of um, wholesale turn away from things that uh, from the gas stove, which then undermines the whole business model and saliency of gas. And I think the other thing I would add is, so I grew up in Northwest England uh, and I used to shovel coal every day to keep our house warm and um, cook our food and, and warm our water in our, our giant agro uh, thing in our kitchen. And I remember one day gas showed up because they'd found gas in the North Sea of, of the West Coast of Scotland. And somehow they got pipes to every little village and we all got gas appliances. And I don't remember how we funded it. Um, I don't remember how my mom paid for it. Uh, but there was a national program and it took 10 to 15 years to get gas into every home, every little nook cranny of the country. Malcolm Gladwell uh, writes about it, by the way, the replacement of, so if you want to find his most recent book, Talking I with do. strangers. I do, and that's so much more complicated than unwinding it. So when we say it took 15 years to put it in, why do we get stuck on, oh, it's gonna take us 10 to 20 years to get rid of it? No, we did this amazing engineering project, and now we need to reverse engineer it, which is basically turn the gas off and string a few more wires. So I actually think we can learn from how they put gas in to get inspired that we can do this so much faster than our current imagination is thinking is possible. Because it was an amazing engineering feat. And who financed it and how did they do it? It's much cheaper and much quicker to get rid of it. And the electricity is already there. Exactly. Exactly. Right. I mean, yeah. they, they dug up every community. Think of putting gas in tall buildings in New York State. That was an amazing engineering project. And now all we're doing is turning it off. And we, it's going to take us 20 years. Come on. Yeah. The electricity wires are already there. We just have to be like power efficient and we can use the same buildings with just electrify them. We've seen this with um, 
talking with a bunch of different commercial electrification engineers and their assertion basically that there's usually enough power there already because all the old stuff they're replacing that's 40 years old is really energy intensive and the new stuff is so efficient. So even though they're adding fuel energy, so like they're electrifying the, the cafeteria or whatever, um, there's enough power there. Right. It's just out of efficiency. And you're like, oh, like LED lighting, you know, just that can create huge amounts of power availability. Yeah, I think this can go a lot faster. So since this is a goss gossipy thing, do you, you, are, you think it's going, going to go faster than say phasing out coal, which you played a lead role in. So how long do you think it, before you got an ex exponential curve? And like, if you were to use your prior experience to look at electrification of, of natural gas loads, what's your thinking? So we started returning coal plants about 10 years ago and we're halfway done. So it's about a 20 year project. Uh, and so what I like about the gas issue, if you take care of California, New York, and Michigan, you're at 25% or Illinois. Um, so you can do Marnie, I just want to like give a pitch for Marnie's who's presenting. Um, let's see, she's from Pontiac and she's going to, so this yeah Marnie's at three o'clock today the midwest building decarbonization coalition pontiac michigan she's going to be great this is going to be a fun one so yes michigan continue that's right so those those blue or purple states in the upper midwest that have always done amazing things on climate some of the first renewable portfolio standards adopting car and truck standards today um, this is the next big opportunity and our niece and team are really on the cutting edge of helping that region which obviously has the cold climate issue right so unlike most of California where we have a fairly mild climate, um, they get to use all those new low uh, cold temperature heat pumps and demonstrate as they are in Massachusetts and Maine and Canada, um, we can do this without burning a lot of fossil fuels. In Alaska, you know, there's some great electrification work that's leadership up in Alaska, big buildings, small homes, tribal, uh, you know, tribal housing up in central Alaska using heat pumps. Like, that's right. yes, we can do this. That's right. And because they're so cold, they consume a lot of gas, right? So there's a real opportunity to take a big chunk of this puzzle, get it done, uh, if we can move the Minnesota, Illinois, Michigans of the world. And they all have climate leadership uh, governors who are committed to doing something about climate change. Woo! Well, um, I'm going to take a 20 minute break to, away from the computer to refresh myself. And thank you, Bruce. Anytime, Sean. Thank you for all you're doing. So um, for everyone else, I hope you don't leave. Just come back at 1.30. We're going to be starting punctually with Payam. Payam uh, Borzorg, um, Borzorg Chami is uh, going to be talking about the 2022 code, the one that is the first sort of heat pump requiring code in our country and uh, has been leadership at the Energy Commission since 2005, technical leadership. So uh, he's been stepping up now into also senior management. And that's going to be a really exciting presentation. Lots of details for those of us who are interested in what does leadership codes look like? This is definitely a successful leadership code, both with a significant addition of mandated PV on lots of different building types, like not just low rise residential, like the not last code. Now it's going into all sorts of different residential type buildings, non-residential type buildings. So um, really delightful stuff. So, but with that, like I said, I'm going to give myself a couple minutes of a break. I'll put up like a cute slide and uh, we'll see y'all soon. <laughs>